Uh, my dad has a big band orchestra. I attended a lot of weddings. And so I, I did have an, a general idea of, of the flow of a wedding. This is Wedding DJ School. I'm Josh Mitchell, your guide to the business of a wedding DJ. We're talking with leaders in the wedding entertainment industry. You're going to learn their backstories, how they got started, and where they are today. Today's episode is with Brian Harris from Brian Harris Entertainment. You're going to love getting to know Brian. He's super professional and he carries himself in such a great way. When I think of a phrase that describes Brian, it's class act. And if you're watching along on the YouTube version of this episode, you'll see how he has his office set up and the stuff that's on the walls. You can just tell that he puts his heart and his soul into everything he does. And you're going to learn that he's a planner. He keeps his DJ set up clean and he's also a lifelong learner. And these are all qualities of world-class DJs and business owners. He's a great role model to learn from, so we're going to go back and learn how he got into the game and where he is today. So here's Brian Harris. Uh, I'm in Dayton, Ohio, uh, which is about an hour uh, north of Cincinnati, about an hour west of Columbus, Ohio. And um, I started my business in 1997, and um, I've always been a single op. Um, yeah, the thought of going as a multi-op has, has definitely come to mind, uh, especially as I talk to other DJs in the industry, but uh, just really never had that uh, desire to go to a multi-op level because I, I have enough on my plate at, uh, as a single op. Have you been full-time since 1997 or how has that looked in terms of your, your capacity? Uh, no, I didn't go full time until 2004. Um, but I, you know, from the time I started um, and realized how much I love doing doing this this uh, this thing called DJing, uh, I knew that I wanted to be full time. So uh, to give you the quick story on that, how I became full time was even though it was a, a goal, it was a plan. Um, it it kind of happened uh, by by accident. Um, I had a, I had a day job and, uh, it was a, my first third shift day job. So it was a really weird, you know, time for me. Um, I worked in a, a machine shop and, uh, working on a machine that I've never worked with before. I should have gone to, this is something that someone goes to college for. Uh, my training was very minimal. And, uh, so long story short, I messed up some parts that probably cost the company a lot of money. Uh, after that happened twice, um, I got fired. <laughs> so, uh, but, but the, the reason I messed up the parts is because the training was like, I had like no little to no training and the guys that were, that were on third shift with me, one or two other guys were on, I couldn't even see them. They weren't even in my, in my view. So it was much harder to get them to come help me with what I needed. So, uh, I got fired. And, uh, that very next day, I, I crunched the numbers, did the math, and realized that. Uh, told my wife, I said, "I, I can, I can do this as a full time uh, DJ. Just have to be very mindful of our spending for a while until you know my my numbers get bigger and and um, you know I, as I raise my price to, to uh, a livable wage." Awesome. So take me back to when you first started DJing. What was that like uh, doing your first wedding or doing some of those early gigs? Um, how did all of that come about? How did you become a DJ and kind of get in into the business? Um, I had a friend that was getting married. I was very close with their their family, with the bride's family, her parents. And um, so she invited me to the wedding. And it's funny because when I look, you know, think back to that time, I'm like, I don't remember having a discussion with myself saying, I want to be a DJ, but somewhere along the line, it, it, it was a thought in my head. So when I got invited to her wedding, um, I said, Hey, do you have a DJ? And she goes, no. I said, can I be your DJ? Uh, okay. It'll be my wedding gift to you. Okay. That's great. And, um, it's, which is pretty funny because nowadays I would never recommend a bridegroom hire a friend that who's never DJed a, a wedding in their life to, to be their DJ. Um, but I had, I had experience with, with weddings, uh, prior to becoming a DJ. Uh, my dad has a big band orchestra. So as a little kid, uh, I spent a lot of time as his roadie 
uh, helping him set up the bandstand. And then I would hang out there in, in the back with my brother, who who's a drummer. I'm also a drummer, but um, so naturally I would hang back with him and watch him play. So I, as a little boy, uh, preteen, I, I attended a lot of weddings, uh, just kind of sitting back and watching. And so I, I did have a general idea of, of the flow of a wedding by the time I got to, you know, doing my first wedding. Um, was it perfect? No, definitely not. Was not perfect. Uh, there's many things I would have done differently. Um, but nothing bad happened at that wedding. Uh, I didn't ruin the wedding by any, by any stretch. It, it just probably wasn't as flowing as, as it, as it could have been, uh, with the knowledge that I have now all these years later. Um, but you know, when you do a friend's wedding, they're definitely a little bit more uh, forgiving. Um, uh, but I also got people up dancing, so that's a good thing. So what was it like when you realized, wait a second, I can actually make real money doing this. Talk to me about when you kind of recognized your value and you recognized that this was something that could be sustainable if you positioned it the right way. I think it was probably around uh, when I went to my first DJ conference uh, in 2002. Uh, that was Mid-America DJ Conference in Louisville, Kentucky. They don't have it anymore, and I don't know how many times they had it prior to me attending, but I went there in 2002, and um, you know I was already making money DJing. Um, it just wasn't enough to live on yet, um, and I didn't know what I didn't know. Um, you know, so obviously... Uh, Trying to be a full-time DJ was my goal. Um, and after attending that conference and meeting a lot of the great DJs, uh, many who I'm still in contact with um, to this day, um, I, I knew that this was a, a sustainable career um, as long as I uh, put my best foot forward and it took the steps that it would take to, um, to get to where, to where I am now, um, especially where I am now. But, um, uh, you know, once I went full-time in, in 2004, um, that's when I, I really, really got serious about the, about the business and, and knew that, um, I didn't want to work for the man anymore. I wanted to work for myself and I wanted to be able to have more time, f uh, for my clients and be able to pr prepare for the wedding. So I'm not working 40 to 60 hours a week at my day job and then trying to find the time to prepare for these weddings. Cause I'm very much a planner and, uh, I would, I never just show up and shoot from the hip. It's, there's gotta be preparation. Um, so yeah, I'd say at that very first DJ conference, I realized that uh, seeing a lot of other success, successful people, uh, doing it, that, uh, I could, I could make it a, uh, I could make money at it. I could make this a career. Fantastic. So talk to me a little bit about what was going through your head when you paid money to go to a conference. And if you're speaking to somebody right now, who's maybe, you know, on the edge about, you know, they, they are thinking about going on a conference, they're thinking about doing some kind of networking event like that. Um, but there's that financial piece of it, they might have to travel, they might have to book a hotel, things like that. Um, talk to me about what went through your mind when you went to that conference in 2002. But then also just kind of in general, how you've seen the value of those kinds of events, um, you know, transform your life and your business. The reason I went to that conference was because of uh, another local DJ um, who I had met right around that time, did bridal shows with. And um, uh, he came up to me and said, hey, you ever been to a DJ conference? No, I haven't. Hey, well, you need to go to this, this one. I, and I believe he was asking me to go uh, that weekend. <laughs> so I had a few days to plan for it. And I'm like, I don't know. You know, I'm not sure exactly what I said, but uh, he it was enough for him to to uh, influence me to, to do it. And, um, uh, once I got there and, and realized what it was really all about, that's when my mind was like, wow, this is, this is really cool. Um, cause I, you know, being my first one, I, I didn't know what to expect. Um, I didn't know if it was just about the gear or, or what I would, what I would see. Um, I, I do remember a couple of the, uh, the guys that spoke, um, a guy named Screaming Scott. He's out of, uh, gosh, he's going to kill me when he, if he, if he watches this. Um, I think he's in Chicago. Uh, I can't remember. Uh, yeah. but he's still a good friend of mine. Great dude. And I, he just, he left an impression on me because he came out, um, and I don't even remember what he spoke on, but his energy was infectious. And that's what that made me go, man, I, you know, this is, this is something I want to definitely do as a career. Um, but 
I, in 2006, I was going to go to, I, I, I did go to my first mobile beat uh, conference in Las Vegas. But in 2005, I was talking about it. And I was like, I don't know if I can really afford it right now. And I'll never forget my buddy, uh, Matt Grauman out of um, uh, somewhere in California. I can't remember. I can't keep up with all these people where they live. It's okay. <laughs> um, I remember him say, this was on a, a chat forum. Uh, Mark Furrow had a, had a chat forum called DJ, uh, Disc Jockey America, DJA. And I remember back when, when the, the, the forum was, you know, before Facebook took, took over, of course, uh, we were talking about mobile beat. And I was like, yeah, I don't know if I can afford to, to go. And Matt chimed in. He goes, you can't afford not to go. Mm-hmm. And just that one f- phrase back to me made me go, you know what? You're right. I'm going to make this happen. Um, so I'm sure I scraped up the money needed and, uh, and I w- flew out there. And then uh, I brought my wife out the next year and she was like, you're not going to these things by yourself anymore. This is too much fun. <laughs> so, um, you know, a lot of people go out to, to the, to mobile beat to Las Vegas for the, the party atmosphere. And yeah, I, I get it. You know, if you're young and you, you enjoy that, um, or maybe you can, you, you can find a balance. But when I go out to these conferences, it's, it, it is strictly to learn. I do enjoy myself in the evenings when we have, you know, get togethers and drinks and whatnot. Uh, great dinners. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the nuggets can be picked up at these dinners, sitting around a table talking about DJ things, um, and out in the hallways. Um, you, you'll hear that all the time from all DJs that that's where, even though the, the, the speakers that, that uh, present are great and great, give great content, you're going to learn a lot of stuff out in the hallways where you think you're just going to be just hanging out talking about whatever. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I went to, to mobile beat and had a great time. And, uh, so if, if I could give any advice to, to someone who's never been there before, um, and has, has been thinking about it, I'll, I'll, I'll say what Matt Grauman said to me. And that is you can't afford not to go to these things. If you want to take your business to, to the next level, if you, if you want to, if you are part-time right now and you want to be full-time, you need to go the, to these conferences. Um, and I, the excuse I hear a lot is, well, I can't get off my job, get off work time, get the time off work. And, you know, you got to find a way to make it happen. If you have to use, use uh, vacation time. Um, so not only are you going to learn stuff there, but you're going to be, you're going to be inspired. Um, if, you know, I, why, why do I go to these every year? Even, even if it's stuff that's, um, that I, I'm already familiar with that the speakers are sp- speaking about. It's that recharge, kind of that battery recharge for the year. Cause mobile beat happens in March, April. And, um, actually it used to start in January, February. It keeps kind of going back farther, uh, farther and farther. But, um, uh, it, it's just kind of a recharge to the system. You, you feel inspired when you come home. I always say if, if you can come back from these conferences with just one nugget that you can apply to your business, just one, it's worth the whole trip. Because if that one little nugget can change how you uh, present yourself in your sales consultation or how you present yourself on the microphone or um, this thing that you do behind the, the, the DJ controls, you know, that that alone is 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 worth the time going to these things. So t- tell me about when when you realized that being a DJ and running a DJ business was more than just the technical music and performance aspect, but that you also ha- kind of had these behind the scenes business things that you had to take care of. What did you learn and what was that process like going from hobby to business? What a question. <laughs> um, I think I learned early on, but um, it probably didn't become more of a... Uh, a reality and, and a real thing until I went full time. Um, you know, as I said earlier, I I've always been someone who is, uh, prepared. Um, I'm always prepping. I, I, you can never prep too much for, for any event. And, and part of that is the stuff that happens during the week. You know, a lot of DJs think that just the weekend is, that's all you got to do. Just show up and do your thing. But no, there's a lot of preparation, um, a lot of communication with with your clients to make sure that you are giving them what what they expect they're, they're paying you to do. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of in the back end. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's not so so much fun, you know. As DJs, we just want to go out there and we want to rock the rock the house and, and get people dancing, right? And um, 
but there's there's the business side of it that you have to take care of or or you'll go out of business if if you aren't you know uh, following up with your clients all the you know every time you get an email from them every time you get a text or or a phone call if you are the guy that just puts it aside and and waits a couple of days or a week until you finally get back that's that's going to bite you in the butt because they're they're going to remember that and they may give you a decent uh, review but they're going to say yeah but he's not really good with communication i had to you know, follow up with him multiple times to get an answer from him. You don't want that. You want to be known as the guy that that is always on top of things that you're keeping them in line. Yeah, and I I find that I I have to do that sometimes with my clients. So that's fine. They're, they're busy doing their life, going to college, uh, working a job, doing both. Um, and and I more often than not, I get my couples who are kind of dragging their feet to to thank me for keeping them. Um, uh, kind of keeping them in check with with what they need to, to to complete for me, so I can do my my prep work. Um, they appreciate that. They're they're not they're actually not uh, bothered by. I love that quote that says the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so many people, That's a, I think that's a great takeaway, especially for those maybe just starting off or, or thinking about getting involved in the industry, is you might think that you've communicated. You might think that you've done your role in uh, you know, letting the other person know what they need to know or following up with them. But oftentimes there's this idea that you actually haven't communicated. You actually haven't uh, taken the appropriate steps to really make that connection. And sometimes you, know, you might be saying it for the second or third time, but really they're hearing it for the first time on their end, especially working with some of the clients that have those bu- busy lives as you're talking about. What but besides communication, and if you want to touch on that again, that, that's fine. But um, what other kind of either tactics or strategies or, or specific things that, that some people might consider as boring or, oh, why do I have to do this stuff between Monday and Friday uh, during the, the work week? Um, what are some of those things that are, are absolutely essential that most people don't realize when they first get into the business are required for success? Another good loaded question. Uh, I, I would say uh, keeping well for one, just one one of many things. Uh, keeping up on music, um, music is it. <laughs> it's just every day. It's, it's, there's new stuff out, um, and with Spotify, uh, it, it makes it hard, makes our job harder to to stay on top of of the music because there's like deep cut, rare stuff that that's coming out every day, and. Um, so in this day and age, a DJ's job is even harder than ever, I think. So belonging to a legitimate record pool, um, can, I, uh, can I give a prop? Go to, for it. Okay. Yeah, go for it. Uh, I use promo only, uh, and I, I believe they're the, one of the best, if not the best, um, uh, music pools to be a part of. The, it's, you know, the music is clean. It's, it's, it's what we need as, as DJs, at least in the uh, – in the wedding field, you know, obviously there's a lot of DJs out there in the, in the clubs and they can play the unedited stuff and that's fine. But for me, I got to have clean material. Um, and as I tell my couples, even though the, the, the bad language is cut out, you know, the, the topic is still maybe inappropriate for your wedding. So it's <laughs> your discretion or my discretion, whether it's appropriate or not. But anyway, the a record pool is, is very important to keep you updated and, and, and just so that way you always have uh, the, the, the latest and greatest uh, music. Yeah, I'll just I'll cut in there for a second and say that um, I remember what life was like before promo only and what life was like after promo only. And I happily, you know, made that payment. Um, I did try BPM Supreme, which I'm not really sold on it. I think I want to go back to uh, to promo only. Um, because of the the frequency of the release schedule and always having the express um, audio, you know, and, and being able to go through and kind of stay up to date. Um, the from I think I started in 2013 with promo only, and I, in the past year I was like, oh, I'll give BPM uh, Supreme a try, and it doesn't even compare. And I don't want to, you know, I don't want to bash any company, and I'm not saying not to use. Um, uh, BPM Supreme, but what I found, and I'm sure what what you're kind of talking about too, is it keeps you in the loop with what the latest releases are, and the the clean edits and the ones that are are going to be able to mix really well into your set. 
And as a professional, you want to have that stuff in all the appropriate formats to be able to to DJ when when uh, when the pressure's on. And those promo only tracks are incredible. Um, so I I'm right there with you. I highly highly recommend that if if uh, if you're somebody's listening right now and hasn't heard of it, transformational for me. I I first joined promo only in like 2000. Actually, I think it was right after um, that Mid America DJ conference in 2002. Um, I didn't, I didn't, at that time, I didn't have any kind of record pool. Um, and so I signed up with promo only. And back then it was just CDs and it was like different. It was like urban mainstream, uh, blah, blah. You know, you had to choose different ones. And I only got the urban and the mainstream, um, not country, not whatever. Um, and then in 2005, I switched to Prime Cuts, which was TM. Back then it was TM Jones, I think. And then, then they changed it to TM Century and then TM Studios and then just kind of Prime Cuts. Um, it kind of, I guess it, but then as many of, of the, of the watchers, listeners out there know, they, uh, they are no longer. I'm, I'm sad, <laughs> but Jim Wise, uh, of Prime Cuts, TM, uh, TM Studios is now working for promo only. So guess where I went back to? I went back to promo only and uh, it's been great. Um, uh, Nick over there at, at, at promo only is, is awesome too. And just, just great people to work with that, that really care about the music and, and getting it to us uh, as, as great as possible. <laughs> Nothing but great things to say about them. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. So this is really good. And some of the just the initial takeaways that we've kind of discussed so far is the importance of networking and and connecting with other professionals in the field are going to move you further faster. You're not going to be able to move as far ahead in the industry um, without other people that are knowledgeable and that have those nuggets of wisdom. So we talked about that. We talked about the importance of communication and really um, staying um, up to date with your clients, making sure that you're the one who's kind of pulling them along and, and keeping uh, them accountable as opposed to them keeping you accountable. And then we talked about systematizing your music process by uh, subscribing to a music pool. What other things have been transformative for you or or what other, like as you look back on your career and, and how you got to where you are today, what are some more of those pivotal moments or some more of those like, man, I couldn't live without this thing or that thing, whether it's a product. I mean, whatever, whatever comes to your mind, I'm curious. Uh, a fan to blow on me to keep me cool. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, that is important, though. Um, you know, one of the I think one of the biggest things that has gotten me to where I'm at now, um, besides just truly caring about what I do um, for a living and, and truly care about my clients, is getting myself into uh, private workshops from guys that I respect who are showing me the things that I didn't realize I'm doing that's not good that and 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 show me things that I didn't even know how to do. Um, and I'll name a couple of those off, uh, the, the workshops I've been through, uh, Mark Farrell, the Marbecca workshop I've been through uh, the love story workshop. I've been through all three levels of the, uh, MC workshop, um, which is bronze, silver, and gold. Um, obviously the, 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 uh, the focus there is, is on the MC role and being the best MC, uh, speaking eloquently and and delivering, you know, uh, that that role for the for your client in the very best way. Um, a lot of guys don't realize how um, uh, I don't know how how badly they speak uh, on the microphone without that training. Um, it could just be as as something as simple as not being very enthusiastic. You know, they think, well, I speak fine. Yeah, but you're talking like this. This is your monotone voice. You know, it's not exciting to hear. And so that the, 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 the guests will tune you out. So, um, that's just one of many things that you, that you'll learn in the MC workshop as far as, um, presenting yourself as the MC. Um, I've been through, uh, Peter Mary's professional process, uh, not once, but twice, uh, because he has a really cool thing where if you, you pay to be a part of it once, you can attend it, uh, for, for free as many times as you want, as long as there's space for you. So I, I went back and, and went through it again. Um, you always learn something new the second time that you didn't pick up the first time. Um, and then I've been through Bill Herman's entertainment experience. And um, so 
to summarize, getting yourself into workshops to learn something that goes beyond wiki wiki <laughs> is so important, especially if you want to put yourself in, um, if you want to take yourself to a, to a higher level of, of, um, service, not just being the DJ, but being the, the MC, being the, uh, the spokesperson for that couple's wedding or that company parties, uh, you know, that, that, you know, they, they need you to be, to carry them along and, um, or that birthday party. It doesn't matter what event it is. If, if you are the DJ and you are the MC to, to help facilitate it, that person who's hiring you, uh, 99% of the time are, are looking to you to be that spokesperson for them to, to make sure that everything runs smoothly. So yeah, get yourself in workshops. It will, it will change your life. It'll change your, 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 your business and it'll change your, your, your personal life, your family. It really will. Awesome. I love it. Um, what is one of your, uh, pet peeves over the years that you've seen other DJs do or say or or behave what's something that just kind of rubs you the wrong way <sighs> man this could open up a whole can of worms <laughs> um just uh, there's so many things but what what i don't what, what rubs me the, uh, the the worst probably is just the bad attitudes from djs out there who don't think that they need the uh, the training that I was just talking about in, in the prior workshops who, who think that that DJs who maybe aren't actually DJing themselves don't have the uh, the right to to teach other DJs. Um, and that's that can be the furthest from the truth. Uh, you know, there are people out there that may not be actual DJs anymore, but they, they, they have the experience, right? They've got 20, 30, 40 years of experience, and that is what they're sharing with, with people. So for, for those that, that are just, just have a bad attitude about it, that, that's one of the biggest pet peeves for me. Um, instead of just letting, letting them do what they do, they have these, these DJs talk bad about, about these other DJs that are trying to help DJs trying to help the industry take it to the next level to a professional level. And, and all they want to do is, is talk smack about them. And, and that's very sad. I totally agree with that. A bad attitude is toxic and you really, you're not going to last long in the industry with uh, that kind of mindset. What's one, like if, if you could impress something on someone that is just starting off early in the game, what is a, ha a bad habit or uh, a thing that you're just like, man, I hate this when, when other people do this, either in their performance, uh, besides attitude, just, you know, in, in that aspect of it. What's one thing that, that if, if somebody were starting off today or they're just getting into the game, a great habit that they can start that's going to set them up for success? There's a lot of, a lot of answers there for sure. Um, you know, when, when DJs first get into the business, the, the, their mindset is, is gear, is focused on gear. I got to have, you know, this gear, this, this, these, these things. And, um, so it, going into it that way, um, one thing I can say is take pride in, in, in your setup, the way that it, it looks, it doesn't matter what equipment you're using. Um, the, the equipment doesn't make the DJ a great DJ because the worst DJ could have the top of the line stuff and still suck. Right. Um, whereas, uh, a great experienced DJ who knows how to do what he does or she does, can have mediocre equipment and still rock it, still kill it. And, and, and so as a, as a new DJ, you're going out there, you're going to the store or whatever, and you're buying this equipment. And now you're going home and you're setting it up or you're setting it up at an event for the first time. Take the time to make it look neat from the audience side. Don't just look at your, the backside from where you're standing, go out to the front, look at what the audience is looking at. And if you see wires and cables, Tuck them away, put, you know, use a skirting around the table, get a facade, um, do whatever it takes to make your, your setup look as neat as possible so that it makes you look as professional as possible. Because I don't care how good you look or I'm sorry, how, how good you are on the mic. If you've got a, a nasty setup, um, people are going to remember that. Well, he was great, but God, his setup was horrible. It's like he didn't care, <laughs> you know, um, but as as um, a lot of DJs will say, nobody cares about a DJ setup more than a, another DJ. Um, it, part of that could be true, 
but people do notice. People do notice if if they'll definitely notice if it's if it's messy. So we're going to pause our conversation with Brian Harris right here, and we're going to pick it up next Friday. We have about 20 more minutes of a conversation that I don't want you to miss, so we're going to save that, and we're going to do a part two. We don't want you to forget about us at Wedding DJ School. You can text Wedding DJ to 44222, and if you send us your email address, we're going to send you a comprehensive checklist, recommended resources to check out, advice on what to do with contracts, and so much more, all for free. Just text Wedding DJ to 44222. We're going to pick up our next conversation with Brian talking about DJ controllers, about equipment, and just how you can continue to grow your business and turn it into something that is a system, not just randomness. I'm looking forward to that. It'll be next Friday with Brian Harris. We'll see you then.